Okay. All right. Welcome to Module 5 Hangouts. This is the last week of the Green in the Economy Lessons from Scandinavia course. And I've got with me today, I'll remind you who I am, Jessica Luth Richter, PhD student here at the IIIE, and I have Naoko Tojo and Jonas Sunshine with me today. And I'll let them introduce themselves and what they do here at the Institute before we start talking about national policies this week. Yeah, hello, I'm Nago Tojo, um, I'm Associate Professor at the IAE. My main uh, policy interest, uh, sorry, research interest being the uh, say em environment oriented product policy. So today I talk mainly about product waste related issues with you today. And Jonas? Yes, my name is uh, Jonas Sonnenschein. I'm also a PhD here at the Institute. And uh, my main research interest is in market-based instruments, specifically for a low carbon economy. And that's where I also do my research at the moment. Mm -hmm. OK, so a really good group to discuss some of the topics that have come up in the forums this week. And I'll just throw out the first uh, topic that we have from students have been talking about the deposit refund, which we mentioned a couple times in videos this week. And one person has, has said, well, it sounds like a really good idea, these mm -hmm. deposit refund schemes. Is there any reason not to have one? Because it seems like there's there's no good reason not to have one in every municipality in every country. So this is a question for, for Nooko in particular, mm -hmm. but are there any barriers or anything we should consider that might be a negative to deposit refunds? The experience suggests that uh, despite all the successes that you have read, that you have heard already, there is a big um, resistance usually coming from the industry, partly because they perceive that it is a, a lot of cost for them to set up such a system. They think it's complicated. And of course, if they don't have to deal with their waste, they want to stay away from that. So the resistance from the industry is one of the big barriers that many countries have experienced so far. So you need to go over that, and there could be there could be different reasons why they want to be engaged. Um, and, and, but uh, you need to have different sort of you need to convince the industry that it is something that they should mm -hmm. do. Another important issue is that, as also discussed in in the video as well, um, the um, the uh, there could be a very uh, there could be a, work, a system that is working very well already yeah. to collect the waste. There is not so much a problem of littering, and Jonas could share a bit of his experience in Slovenia. On that. Yes, I've been uh, living and working for three years in in Slovenia, a small country in the Alps, and um, they have a very good culture of keeping the countryside clean. So there is no issue with littering. And at the same time, uh, recycling is uh, widely applied throughout the country. So there's a separated collection and recycling system. And in that case, um, maybe a deposit refund system for beverage containers is not really needed. Uh, yeah. So there is none in, in Slovenia right now. Yeah. yeah, so it's a policy that addresses a problem. And you first need to make sure that you yes. have that problem yeah. in the first place. And then I guess. Uh, in the forum, a couple of people also had an hypothesis that maybe it's also how deposit refund schemes are designed. Exactly. Uh, that could lead to some, some differences. Do you have an example of a deposit refund scheme that maybe isn't designed in a way that, that uh, creates acceptance? I think one of the very interesting examples came from, uh, interestingly enough, Germany, which is otherwise usually known to be a country that is very organized and also a front runner in different areas in relation to environment. What happened that was that they had they're having a very good working system for collection and uh, recycling of packaging waste, but for the uh, they introduced the uh, deposit refund system in 2004, basically with the legislation requiring that if the uh, certain quota of a specific type of packaging a beverage containers are not meet is sort of are not met, then then the industry has to have the deposit refund system. What happened was that the, the industry started to have a sort of a system based in a nutshell that the uh, consumers need to bring back the uh, containers from which they buy that particular container, which makes the whole system, as you can imagine, very, very chaotic. So one probably, uh, they have changed, they have changed and updated the system since then, but that was sort of a so very strong lesson learned that you cannot make the system very complicated. You can you can 
basically make it as simple as possible and convenient as possible for the consumers. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't want consumers to be buying things in one place, beverage containers, and not be able to return it to another place if, yeah. Yeah, and make it too easy. I still remember that time when it was introduced in Germany and we had plastic bottles from five different shops uh, at home and to return them we had to go back to these five different shops. So. That's how it was then you might way. argue also the environmental yeah, <laughs> case exactly. of having exactly. people going all over the place to return. Yeah. Um, okay, so policy design is a big part of it, and recognizing what the problem is that the policy is to address seems like a good idea with um, that one's bet. Yeah. Brings us into the second question that we have from this week in the forums, which is also related to waste. There was a question about electronic waste, and somebody had brought up, you know, what what is done with electronic waste around the globe, and we talk a bit in the in the videos about extended producer responsibility mm -hmm. for waste. But this one was also saying, you know, in, in, in this country um, where the student was writing from a lot of waste and electronic waste in particular is discarded in the forest. And what could be done with this? And, you know, it, from discarded in the forest reminds me of uh, historically something that was done even here in Sweden. And <laughs> you might have some more stories about that. Yeah, the interesting story with Sweden there is that they have lots of problems, at least perceived problems, in Sweden regarding the abandonment of cars in forests. Cars, they are big, but then they, uh, well, you can drive to the forest, I guess, and then you, you just dump it there. So in the middle of the 1970s... Walk, that, walk back. <laughs> <little more. laughs> well, that's true. You need to go with another person who is tired enough to drive you back. But um, anyway, so uh, that was perceived as a very big problem uh, in 19, the middle of the 1970s, as early as that. So uh, the, uh, the, the country introduced actually a deposit refund-like system. We don't get into the details of that, but anyway, basically, the, uh, when a new car is purchased, then the, 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 the owner, the, the purchaser, needs to pay a small amount of premium. When they return the car to the uh, authorized uh, car dismantling, dismantling facility, then they can deregister the car. And when they do that, then they get some money back. And that gives an incentive for people to bring it back to the right place. So that was sort of how Sweden dealt with the, the, uh, the abandoned cars in the forest in the 1970s. And they actually continued that system up to the middle of the 1990s. But then they renewed the system to this one based on the, as Jessica said, the producer responsibility concept. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, that could be a way of dealing with the e-waste as well. I haven't heard any countries really having a deposit refund-like system, mm. except that there are some buyback systems and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But with um, electronic waste, so, I mean, in particular, this is an important waste stream because we see it as one of the fastest growing waste streams, particularly here in Europe and around the world. Mm. And um, in terms of environment, um, extended producer responsibility for it, another question that came up with the forum is, will we see more global um, policies for extended producer responsibility? And what are the global issues with e-waste and how are they being handled? Mm -hmm. Do you have some thoughts around that? A good question. We can say, just going back a little bit with producer responsibility, it has been very much based on a country-specific system. In the, in the case of e-waste in the 1990s, there are some countries in, in Europe as well as in Asia starting to have the producer responsibility based system for electronics, such as Sweden, Switzerland. Switzerland was actually the first one, Norway, Norway Netherlands, and Sweden. In Europe, in Asia, there, Taiwan, Japan, actually, they came even earlier than some of those European countries. Then you introduced the directive. North America state-based or province-based solutions, but very much based on sort of the nation-based system. Mainly because it is, at the end of the day, the current EPR system is very much on taking care of the end-of-life products. Mm. There's a big aspiration to provide incentive for design change, as you have heard, but this uh, taking care of waste is also a very important part. When you think about that part, that is very much, even within a country, waste management is done at the local level, you, the, especially the collection part of it, and that is better handled based on the sort of specific context of the 
local. So therefore, sort of it hasn't come into the global system. Mm -hmm. But then uh, do we talk about how it works, or maybe people know about it. Yeah, I mean, I guess one question how it works, but maybe for those countries that don't have one yet, you know, how would they, what's the, kind of the first question you need to ask? I would think the first question that needs to be asked is who pays for these systems? And in yeah. Europe, primarily we have this extended producer responsibility, so producers are responsible, yeah. or at least partly responsible in each case for financing yeah. the scheme. So is that a kind of a, a basic principle of, of these EPR? Yes, yeah. I mean, in the sense, at the end of the day, consumers are paying through the price of the it goes passed on. Yeah, it gets passed on, but it, it is from the pocket of the producer, let's say, that it is the uh, it is financed by the producers in that sense. And also it is usually them somehow involved in the organization not aspect of it. Although they do not usually do it themselves, they usually have some kind of a consortium who work together and then the consortium takes over the responsibility of organizing. But that's one of the very important aspects of how you organize the system. And then usually the producers get involved. However, then there are some municipalities, there are some retailers who may, depending on the type of product and so forth we talk about, they're more suited for the collection. Mm -hmm. And what kind of existing system there they are is also a question. So based on those different sort of parameters, um, different countries choose different ways yeah. in organizing them. And you can have different actors. So some in yeah. some countries, I mean here in Sweden, we now recently have more options with retailers to yeah. bring it back to the grocery store, our small electronics. And that's something new. It used to be much more with the municipalities. Yeah. And it still is that option, but then there's additional options continually being added. And then I know in Switzerland it is more the norm to bring it back to the retailers um, than even the municipalities. So yeah, yeah. context specific. Shall we talk a little bit about then the actual end of life where, where the electric waste ends up? Yeah, yeah. because it's solving all the issues. Because yeah. you mentioned before it's a local issue and the collection is definitely a very local issue, but then the next step is not necessarily anymore a local issue. Yeah, that's really a yeah, very important question. What happens after it is collected and, and brought to the recycling plant? Well, it depends also how, what kind of... Well, most of the waste, let's say, that are collected in Europe, in Asia, in North America, and so forth. If it comes to the responsible sort of recycling facility, at least nowadays they consider what to do with that. But then uh, there are many documentations that we can find still uh, that men they're sort of part of them being taken care of within a country, but there are many of those that go outside of the border. Mm -hmm. And that is a very big issue because, it, especially if it is going to the developing area, not only the countries that doesn't have really good capacity to take care of it, but maybe they have some interest. They, there could be some valuable materials, yeah. right? And yeah. we hear about the gold in our mobile phones and computers now, and that's certainly of interest for informal recyclers. Yeah. But there is also toxics. Exactly, there are toxics. And they usually, what they usually do in some of the, uh, the sort of rudimental, rudimental sort of quite bad sort of recycling facilities, they just burn it, they just take out the whatever valuables, but then what do you, do you do with all those non-valuable stuff? They could be dumped into the river, they could just put aside mm -hmm. on the land. And there are many problems both in terms of the environment both, and as well as health of the people working there as well as the surrounding community. Mm -hmm. living at people living in some current community and there was a big highlight of that issue in the beginning of 2000 in a place called Huayu, China where it was one of those hubs of the electronic waste going mm -hmm. we saw pictures in the magazines yeah, this, yeah. was it from North America from Europe from wealthy Asian countries and so forth. and then now because of it was because partly of the uh, Chinese government taking measures, also the uh, economic development of the country, and so forth. Many of those sort of rather 
uh, rudimentary recycling is taking place in African countries. In Africa, yeah, yes. Nigeria, Ghana, and so forth. So it's just the immigration of the program. So, so would you say this is really uh, not an issue of the existing legislation in countries like Europe and North America, but more of the enforcement and monitoring? It's partly that. Yeah, well, it's actually, I would say, mainly that. Yeah, yeah. enforcement side. Yeah. Because there are also the documentation showing that it's supposed to be taken care yeah. of. Mm. People with good will go to the municipal facility, for instance, in the UK, bringing that, yeah. and it goes ends up being in yeah, North Africa. Yeah. Another problem related to that is that, that there is a this, there's very difficult there's a difficulty in distinguishing between reusable mm -hmm. secondhand products mm. and uh, waste. Yeah, and often the, the shipment takes place in under the pretext of reuse. Yeah, but it looks like computers and printers, so yeah. that could be used in, in these countries, but they're not actually used. Yeah. yeah, and there could be some reusable parts, but what we do with the non-reusable part, you discard it, and then the same story comes. Yeah, yeah, so there's still a lot of work to be done in yeah. that area, it sounds like. There are conventions about this, the Basel Convention yeah. about this, and there are EPR schemes, but this is still happening, and it's how to address this best. Because there's also the the idea that some of these countries want the the resources. <laughs> That's another issue. But the without the environmental burden of it, so there's there's yeah quite a few aspects to it. It gets complicated. Definitely. Maybe just to highlight that there are also some producers trying to work with this issue outside of the country in a country where there's no legislation. Mm -hmm. Like many of the mobile phone companies, they try to also collect their mobile phones. Mm -hmm. They at least try to establish some networks. And then that's sort of one we can say global initiative in done in the private sector. Mm -hmm. But how much they are collecting and so forth is a good question mark. And not only because they don't make enough efforts, that could be one part of that, but another part is that it's lucrative. It's a very valuable product. So it's often taken up by someone else mm -hmm. whose treatment may not be yeah. optimal. optimal. Yeah, <laughs> the same standard. So we have quite a bit of interaction here. We've been talking about national policy, but it quickly goes into international policies too, mm -hmm. because a lot of the mm -hmm. issues overflow from a national context. Yeah. Um, we'll just go into a, a, the next thread here we have from the forums this week. Related to a little bit to waste, but also switching into energy, and I think uh, we have some interesting insights here from both of you about nuclear energy was brought up, and is it really a green energy, and what is the role of nuclear energy on the road to a more renewable energy base? So it would be very interesting to hear your opinion coming from Japan, and your opinion working with renewable energy. What, what do you think about nuclear energy? Maybe starting with the uh, waste issue. Yeah, <laughs> that we just been. <laughs> yeah, just saw a very nice analogy between the the e-waste. Yeah. I mean, it's something we have at home, right? Mm -hmm. And we most of us don't really know where to put it. Yet. Yeah. I mean, in the case of e-waste, it's sort of clear there are options we can bring it back to the municipality. No, maybe most people don't know. In the case of nuclear waste. We also store it at the power plants right now, and we really don't know where to, where to do with it. And that, unfortunately, is not yet an option. And maybe another point is that some people see a lot of value in the e-waste that is still at our homes, and there's a movement called urban mining. Yeah. And there are also people seeing still the value in, in the in the waste. So just yeah, uh, totally. Yeah. Uh, no, I think as Jonas mentioned, I think that that's one of the huge issue, and that is going to last for ten tens of thousands of yeah. years. So what do we do? And then we still don't know what happens after that. Yeah. Is it really going to be detoxified by that time? What happens during that time, the storage of that, and how do you secure that? An interesting example you gave, to be honest, two years after the storage place. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. in Germany, yeah. uh, the government is still looking for a final storage place, and the one that was picked, uh, uh, and actually, People start, our company started putting their barrels with nuclear waste into it, they started leaking. It's an old salt cavern. And now it's it's a huge cost and it's not clear how actually to dig up this waste again and put it into different final storage place, which doesn't exist yet. No. So. Yeah, I mean, the long term, from what we hear, a lot of it's still being stored as safe as it can, but in temporary storage because we don't mm. have these answers yet. And I guess one one question is when we when we talk about nuclear, sometimes it's seen as a as a cost effective option, but is it taking into account all of these 
uh, end of life issues that say are the waste that from which you know is that part of the cost or the price of nuclear energy? It's a good question because there are lots of subsidies going on in the countries so that nuclear is promoted. And uh, for instance, in, in Japan, uh, there the storage place is also a huge issue. And municipalities, they go to the municipalities that is so far away from the big cities and so, but many local municipalities don't want that. Mm. So they are trying to give money, the government tries to give money, basically different subsidies of different kinds of sorts okay. to allude basically the local community, but still they have problems. But then you can really question if that money is coming from the revenue uh, or the sort of the financing system of the energy company. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. In that case. I think one other missing cost factor that is often mentioned is is the limited liability. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so actually a nuclear power plant cannot ensure its operation. No. So in case of an accident, just a minor percentage of the damage done is actually covered by, by uh, a company by or an insurance. Insurance. Yeah. Yeah. And the rest is covered by a society or the yeah. government. So this is another cost that is not included. And then if we just look at the, at the direct cost of installing a nuclear power plant and then running it, uh, we see at least in Europe right now, uh, current experience have, have, been, have shown that it's very costly. In Finland, uh, the construction of the latest power plant mm -hmm. has been postponed several times for several years. Mm -hmm. Now in the UK, the Hinkley Point uh, new uh, nuclear power plant is still in the planning phase, not, not yet constructed. It was approved by the European Commission mm -hmm. that the UK government can grant a feat in tariff for 35 years for all the electricity that is produced by this, this plant above market mm -hmm. rates. So that right. gives an indication how expensive it is, especially in the European context right now. Yeah. So, uh, so, so yes. maybe if we go on critical factors, where to store the, the, the waste, mm -hmm. uh, there's a risk of accidents and you from Japan, you know very well what happened. There's a risk of proliferation. Mm -hmm. There's a high risk that the first planning scenario underestimates the cost. That's so, really so, the issue, yeah. On the other hand, I mean, we had a very back and forth debate in the forums, and, and there's a reason for it. I mean, there are some positive aspects of nuclear power, like yeah. it's sort of carbon-free source of energy. Once it is there and has been built, and you forget about the waste, it's cheap. But okay, you have to forget about many things to make it cheap. Well, we, we, let's not forget we have nuclear power here in Sweden yeah, as well, exactly, which is what exactly. I was trying to bring up. Like, it is part of us being a, a low carbon. It's, it's part of that mix right now. Yeah. And and some people say it is sort of better than coal. Mm -hmm. That coal kills more people because there you have the direct emissions and cancer caused by these direct emissions. And the link is quite clear. Um, so. I think still, I mean, and then it goes more into the direction of opinions than mm -hmm. really uh, thorough analysis, that on the long term, I don't see how nuclear can be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. On the short term, being from Germany, and now Germany is going through this energy transition, I, I would have liked to see that the nuclear power plants run, the existing ones run a bit longer, but coal is phased out first, mm -hmm. and then nuclear power. But another very pragmatic argument is, and sometimes you have to be pragmatic in policy making, that a coal phase out was never politically feasible in Germany, while there was a very strong anti nuclear movement. So to actually trigger this change of the system, uh, of, and now we have a system of highly decentralized electricity production with many private individuals, farmers, cooperatives as owners, um, and the transition goes on. Uh, this has been triggered by the nuclear phase-out, clearly, and this was very, very positive aspect of this nuclear phase-out. Wow, that's really cool, and I am almost, almost envious to hear that <laughs> <laughs> Japan is with uh, such a problem that many people see, and there was such a strong movement and feeling from society, and you talk with the non-environmentalists, non everyone was agreeing, at least after the, uh, the, the accident, it, 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 I mean, of course, it, was triggered by a very big natural disaster, but anyway, it happened. Mm. And after that, I mean, many people are really against the nuclear power. But um, it's amazing how strong the lobby and the existing power 
of the uh, nuclear industry is in Japan, mm -hmm. and that uh, and that the, that the the current consulting government really some sort of now re-promoting the uh, nuclear power and many people pointing that we are not even solving the problem, that there is still a mission going on in Hiroshima, not really closing down yet. Mm -hmm. We are still fighting to deal with the problem and we are still, so we are talking about reopening. And at the moment, nuclear powers are shut down, I mean, it's not moving, but started to sort of, mm -hmm. there's, there's, I think, one plant that started to work yeah. and then it's moving on towards that direction. And, and I think here we have one more aspect yeah. uh, in the Japan case, of why big nuclear, just like big coal or big oil, is a big barrier to, towards actual change. Yeah. I, I mean, in Japan, from one day to the other, all, basically from one day to the other, all the nuclear power plants have to be shut up. Yeah. And it, I mean, the country didn't collapse. Yeah. I mean, okay, behavior had to be adjusted, uh, yeah. air condition had to be uh, changed, and, and some um, trade offs had to be made. But it was possible, yeah. and it is a big driver of energy efficiency yeah, definitely. And, and shifting loads over the day and so on. So suddenly, creative solutions had to be found yeah. in this situation because there was such a big pressure. Yeah, and this shows that yeah, sometimes these these large old industries, uh, power industries, um, are really a barrier to a more innovative, flexible energy system. Yeah, you are locked into the yeah. solution. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That actually nicely <laughs> segues into another question we have this week um, about you know the, the old established uh, fuels or forms of energy. We had a question about this recent drop in oil price. Is that going to slow the adoption of green practices now that, that oil is much cheaper? Mm -hmm. Do we think it's going to last? I, I think the first thing we could do is to reframe this question and say, isn't it also an opportunity? And uh, the Economist, which is not like at the forefront of the green movement, uh, had the title page um, asking whether this should be now the moment to actually introduce and increase uh, taxes on fuels. Mm -hmm. Because we all felt the drop in oil prices when, when, when filling our cars, but sort of in this moment, I think consumers would be much more open for a shift in taxation, maybe even a shift from uh, uh, labor towards resources mm -hmm. and, uh, and fuels. So it's not just a challenge, but also an opportunity. When we come to the challenging part of the low oil price, it's a big question mark how long this low oil price will last. Mm -hmm. And we see some big oil traders actually hiring vessels and then oil tankers just to fill them up to the top with oil and keep them in the port because they're betting on an increasing oil price. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So this could be one indication that this is a, a temporary phenomenon. Yeah. The, the second is that it's actually the consequence of a price war of many Saudi Arabia uh, with North America. Mm -hmm. North America has a lot of unconventional oil, which is a bit more expensive in production. Saudi Arabia is producing very cheaply, so they're artificially keeping the production very high mm -hmm. to lower the price to outcompete more expensive producers in North America. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the idea behind this strategy is at some point to, 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 to uh, lower the production again in Saudi Arabia once this battle is won, and then the oil price will really shoot up. So okay. temporary, yes, but I think on the mid to long term, it's not an issue. And, and we see now the prices for renewables being actually in many areas competitive already. Mm -hmm. So okay. and power, power, is a, power is a completely different question than oil. So yeah. it's 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 a bit linked, but it's not completely linked. So, mm -hmm. so actually, if you talk about wind and solar, it's not so much affected by the oil price. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This would be my take on that question. Yeah, but I think it's good that you see it reframed as a as an opportunity because I mean we're just talking about the Japanese situation. Mm -hmm. of, of you have this opportunity here, you have political will towards a certain um, solution and. That's the time to yeah. seize that. So it might be also the time to see some more uh, policies around carbon pricing, which haven't been um, or had, let's say, the political acceptance or public acceptance, mm -hmm. political will, let's say, in many countries that now might be that window of opportunity yeah. for that. Absolutely. Okay. And like oil shock, and don't forget the history, right? <laughs> you yeah. Know? No. The yeah. price goes up and down. down. Yeah. Before, yeah. And we've seen. 
policies in place too, but we've also seen in the last few years lots of carbon pricing policies fail or be even retracted outside. But here in Sweden, there's a, a strong history of carbon pricing mm -hmm. um, for a while, which you heard about in the videos. Um, but I, another question that has been brought up by the forums is about how effective carbon markets have been. So in one case, we have a, the tax, mm -hmm. uh, and we have that here in Sweden, but we also are part of the EU um, emissions trading schemes. So we're also part of carbon markets. And are they effective, mm -hmm. is the question. Uh, it's a very valid <laughs> question, I would say. Um, and I think, again, a question where you have to clearly separate between the academic and theoretic view on it and, and the practical implica uh, implementation. Mm -hmm. I mean, in theory, to have a cap that is maybe informed by science and is really a tough cap is a super instrument because you know what will be your environmental outcome. Mm -hmm. And then the, the market takes care of uh, reaching that outcome effectively uh, and efficiently. Um, there's a lot of flexibility for industry, that's why they all bought into it. Um, however, if you don't have this tight cap, and also some other design tweaks in the system, it might actually become a barrier. So what we saw in Europe with the European uh, trading scheme after some uh, initial higher prices of around 20 euros per ton, it really dropped now to five to seven euros per ton. That means the idea behind market-based instrument to give a price signal to investors and to reflect the true price of an asset, in this case, the atmosphere as a sink for carbon, has in this case failed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no incentive, and we've talked to several energy companies here in Sweden, no incentives to invest into abatement technology if there's a price of five to seven euros. It has to be mm -hmm. much higher. So there's a missing incentive, but a cap has been set. A cap has met. been set and <laughs> met. So in that sense, it works. Yeah. Uh, however, the second intention to not mm -hmm. just leave this cap, but to trigger innovation, trigger new technology, investments into it has not been met at all. Yeah. And there are many reasons to explain why why the cap was met that easily. Yeah. One is that it allowed for offsets to, to actually get allowances to remit CO2 by buying them from pro projects in developing countries. Mm -hmm. um, it's a whole new area where a lot of criticism has been uh, brought forward mm -hmm. that these systems are not actually additional emissions reduction, especially in countries like China, Korea, India, that, that are not really developing countries anymore, but more countries in transition, who can finance their own, own wind parks and own uh, covers for landfills and whatever projects you have there. That's one criticism. The second criticism is that the cap is not adjusted to economic developments. Mm -hmm. So we saw the big recession in 2008, 2000, yeah. starting 2008, 2009. And of course, when economic activity goes down, or doesn't go up as much as anticipated. Then also energy demand goes down, mm -hmm. and as a consequence, also CO2 emissions go down. And the system couldn't react to that. Yeah. Um, so you, you see the next car there going yeah. down, but it's yeah. not really because exactly. there are some changes. It would have happened yeah. naturally, yeah. probably. It means a loose cap. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then one often heard criticism is that the cap was too loose from the start. So mm -hmm. more would have been possible, and that could be the result of strong policy lobbying. Also, incentives have been further diminished because allowances to admit were given away for free for many years. Mm -hmm. Now they are sold slowly in the European system, starting with 20%, starting with the power sector, until 2020, then finally 100% of the allowances will be sold. Mm -hmm. But still, if the cap doesn't decrease, they will be sold at the price of seven euros right now in the options. Mm -hmm. So, and I think, yeah, we mm -hmm. can talk then a little bit about the fixes to the system. Yeah, I think they, they, they're they discussing right now how to fix the EU emissions trading scheme. And there's a few different options, but I think one of the options is also to have a more flexible cap where you can put in or out mm -hmm. some of these units, depending yeah. on, so you kind of get a feel for how much there is in the market and how much you need in or out. And we saw that already, I mean, as a panic reaction a little bit, because yeah, the price was so low, some of the emissions were taken out in 2012 uh, to be re-injected in 2020, mm -hmm. um, just to increase the demand on the short term. Yeah. Now it's a big question what retiring that Exactly. Right. So that could be one way to tighten the cap more and maybe also to increase the rate of 
reduction from 1.7% to 2.2% every year, tighter cap. Second could be actually to have a floor price in the auctions. So now it's auctioned off for, as we said, five to seven, eight euros. If we have a floor price of 20 euros, then it would work effectively as a tax. So in the auctions, companies would have to pay at least 20 euros. Yeah, so and if there's so much supply, euro, then yeah. Tax yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, less offsets, also that has been implemented already, so mm -hmm. that actually the emission reductions have to take place in Europe, mm -hmm. in the companies, in the industry sector. So there are some ways out. However, it still is a big question how many of these reforms will be implemented. And it's a big, big debate now. As it is right now, we can even say in, in some context the emissions trading scheme is a barrier to, to further action, especially unilateral action of, of individual countries. Mm -hmm. Again, from my experience working in Slovenia, and I know several so other countries have CO2 taxes, Ireland, it's a bit of a specific case. <laughs> yeah, Anyways, yeah. if you want to argue for increasing these CO2 taxes, which are paid by small, medium-sized businesses, uh, by the transport sector, it is very hard to convince policymakers if they see the price for allowances being at five to seven euros yeah. and the CO2 tax already being more, many times higher, 20 euros, 25 euros, in Sweden, 100 euros. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although it's combined with energy tax, so it's a bit difficult to see how yeah, much of this 100 yeah. euros is actually CO2. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, carbon markets right now have not delivered yet, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are very few contexts. I don't know what the Tokyo is often brought. They have a Tokyo trading system. Yeah. And this is the only system that actually achieved quite high prices, uh, at least in the short run. Yeah. Not big... I cannot really talk no. much about that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. on the, the general experience, be it California, mm -hmm. be it the European Union, New Zealand, I think is that uh, so far they have not uh, delivered especially as an innovation driver and, and, and transition driver, really. And then, I mean, you mentioned some of the other jurisdictions outside of Europe that have emissions trading schemes too. Is it one of the issues that it isn't a, a we talk about the next climate uh, negotiations coming up, but still these markets are not um, widespread, really. It's just a few markets around the world, mm -hmm. some very big, and the, the EU ETS is why we talk so much about it, one of the biggest or the biggest. Mm. I should say, but is it a problem that, that there isn't carbon pricing globally? What's the issue with, uh, with that we hear then about companies being able to leave? Mm. I think we have seen very little of that. So this carbon leakage, because the price was just way too low and the effort to move to big. So uh, this could become an issue once it's a higher price. And then of course, it, I mean, everybody would agree it would be nice to have a global system with a tight cap and a high price. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but then uh, we see in Europe already that just getting minor reforms is such a difficult task. And you have very diverse countries. You have Poland with a big coal sector, which, which is blocking at the moment reforms. Then you have some countries who have Scandinavian countries, Germany, who are investing much into uh, restructuring of the energy system. We're pushing further. Yeah. So you have too many different interests already in this small uh, regional scheme. Yeah. Yet a global scheme is, is, in theory, a great thing to have. In practice, difficult to push through. And then, of course, you're right. Then it's difficult to design, again, the policies, be it national or regional, in a way that you get also the environmental effect that you want to have. So yeah. having a very high price on carbon in Sweden alone it uh, doesn't help because then probably the steel and paper sector would slowly move out of the country mm -hmm. and produce somewhere where it definitely wouldn't produce cleaner than it does in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So then the question is of how to design these policies and in include maybe some border taxes mm -hmm. and we have issues with the trade. WTO yeah. or the yeah. trade yeah. agreements. So it's a complex question, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question in the forum was, so what is the... <laughs> impact of the uh, carbon trading or carbon markets so far and so far unfortunately i would say well yeah, but the, maybe uh, also we count we can say that there's a lot been learned that we're yes. seeing that these are improving mm -hmm. and that they they did not get translated theory into practice well the first time mm -hmm. um 
and that they they need to be tweaked and worked on a lot. So we see where they go, I think, mm. too. And then we see that yeah, the movement is maybe towards something that is more like a carbon tax. Yeah. Uh, with a floor price uh, in a trading system that is uh, quite high, it's effectively a tax. Uh, and then you have the security for investors. Then they know, okay, we have this floor price. It will not be lower than this for the next, say, 10 years. And, and then it makes sense to invest. If you say, okay, we have this history of emissions trading prices between 5 and 10 euros going up, going down a little bit. So shall we really invest into new low carbon technology? Mm -hmm. and we don't know yeah. what will happen in the next 10 years. So this planning security is really one key element of, of the design of policy instruments. For investors yeah. to be able to, yeah, they need the certainty there. And But as you said, that might be some something part of these future trading that we see more floor prices coming in, a bit of elements of tax, which were actually proposed first in a lot mm -hmm. of these jurisdictions. Before carbon trading, they were proposing carbon taxes, but they weren't politically viable. So maybe now the role oh. of carbon markets as, or trading, as we've seen it, was to make this pricing viable in some ways, because it's being discussed at least. This is one of the ironic factors of the whole climate change uh, uh, policy process that actually the US suggested carbon trading and flexible mechanisms yeah. at the first place, and that was one key condition to join the Kyoto process. Mm -hmm. So other yeah. countries or the European Union was very skeptical, was more in favor of the tax. They said, okay, we do it to get everybody on board. And, now and the then the European yeah. yeah. Union implemented it, and the uh, US never ratified Kyoto. So. Yeah, it's interesting yes, also uh, the, when when you look at the sort of not so successful situation with the carbon market. When you look at other substances like acid related, like SOX and so mm -hmm. they have wonderful sort of yeah. past records at least of mm -hmm. the, the situation, for instance, in the U.S. where they sort of having a specific uh, sort of mechanism for the uh, different uh, uh, manufacturing incineration. Installations. Do you have any thoughts of the type of issues we are covering? Does that make a huge difference? Yes. Does they come versus so snow? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think, especially right now, it's very high uh, on the agenda and in, in the communication, the question of the carbon bubble. Yeah. That so many companies and even countries have invested so much mm. into the extraction and distribution and use of fossil fuels, carbon based fuels. That if we would burn all that which is already now in the reserves, we would exceed the uh, emissions uh, that ensure sort of remaining within two degrees of warming mm -hmm. by five times. Mm -hmm. So there is, of course, a structural issue here already yeah, yeah. That, um, that pushes uh, this type of legislation to be very soft. Mm -hmm. So this consumer oriented or end of the supply chain uh, legislation. So that's why also parts of the environmental movement are now moving to, towards the beginning of the supply chain, saying, okay, maybe we should tackle actually the exploration. So it's a bit schizophrenic system where some countries, like the UK, for example, supports exploration of oil and gas, actually make a law to maximize the benefits from that. At the same time, they have a very ambitious climate change agenda to basically phase out uh, CO2 emissions by 2050. Yeah. So you can see this schizophrenic mix at the moment. And so maybe there is a point moving both the environmental movement, but also maybe policies a bit up in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it is difficult, as you say, when we're dealing with structural change, when we have the the sulfur oxide trading schemes too. It's it's one particular thing, and they yeah. had had fixes for it. They actually ended mm -hmm. up finding were much cheaper than they thought it was going mm -hmm. to be at the beginning. We're also finding that some of the carbon fixes also are, are cheaper, as you said. The price goes down, but not all of them, and it requires a, a much bigger change on yeah. a much wider scale. So I think it's it's much more complex. Yeah. So while we thought uh, we'll we'll take this policy solution from this one context and apply it to another context, I think the lesson here is it doesn't always it doesn't work, work yeah, in another maybe. context, both you know geographically yeah. in a national context, but also problem specific yeah. context. Um, that it's going to require a lot more work in the area of, of carbon pricing than it did in some of the some of the earlier results that were leading us to think this is the way to, yeah. to tackle this problem. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I mean, another con talking about contexts that make a difference. One of the one of the forums, there was a student who brought up to what extent does the environmental policies in a country rely on the political system mm -hmm. context? And I was wondering your thoughts about this. This was a student from from Belarus saying, you know, in, in our context, the environmental ministry is just ticking a box in some cases. Um, and you know, then we're, we're giving examples from Scandinavia here. To what extent does the Scandinavian success owe to also the political system in place from your point of view? Good question. I mean, it's a very difficult issue to generalize, but I think that the other, in, order to, in order to sort of have a good policy and also have it implemented in a good way, you need to have participation of people from the different level. So one of the key sort of feature of the uh, Scandinavian system probably is that you have a rather open, sort of democrat, open and democratic society, and it's rather flat. And there are of course <laughs> pros and cons around that, yeah. but still, and people have the possibility to provide their say, and that sort of provide opportunities for different level of decision making and also different. So people at a different level can take actions. And if that is not really allowed, I think it makes it very difficult to sort of raise the overall sort of effectiveness, effectiveness. and maybe yeah. yeah. for policies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because politicians and the uh, people sort of sort of touched. And of course you can think about the situation where you have a super clever dictator <laughs> who could really make things work and then mm -hmm. this, I mean the ideal situation in a dictatorship country that may happen but unfortunately that's not the situation. No. Not so, no. No. I think you need to, as a sort of necessary condition almost a, an open democracy yeah. and then one where it's not covered by other very very urgent issues. I think one example is Greece at the moment, where now the left party is in power, which had a very green profile to begin yeah. with. But now even Cyprus said in several interviews that um, it's just not the, the most current issue right now. So, yeah. so and probably in, in, in the MENA region, the East and North Africa, we see similar movements where, where environment is just not on the top of the agenda right now. Yeah. But OK open democracy definitely and probably needs a little bit more than that even yeah to have sort of a strong ngo sector mm -hmm. um, that is that is uh, allowed to take part yeah. uh, in in the decision making and unfortunately there are some movements also within europe mm -hmm. uh, hungary could be one example where the green ngo sector is actually losing uh, because of political suppression uh, it's say in the open debate, so it's not yeah. really an open democracy anymore. No. And you also talked about prioritization, and maybe one of the one of the keys here too is that environmental, as we're learning with a lot of this, is linked to a lot of other areas. Mm. That when we're talking about greening the economy, it's also about opportunities, economic opportunities, as well as just environmental. So maybe recognizing where where both can be achieved is also part of the political awareness that it's not always a trade-off between environment and economy yeah. to get out of a recession, but it could be an opportunity yeah. with greening the economy to get out of a recession. And probably there's not just one political, cultural, social system that is favorable for, for good performance. We can see Sweden as an example where there's huge trust in, in government. Mm -hmm. There's not such a big NGO movement or actually a very small uh, non-governmental sector pushing, but still super performance. So mm -hmm. it's it's valid trust in, in, in into the into the system. Mm -hmm. While for example in Germany the energy system is now transforming because there was a strong bottom-up movement. So mm -hmm. it's owned by cooperatives now. It all started with the nuclear movement and these people from the nuclear movement are now in power. So it's a it's a different story, but also a decent performance or at least a good trend. I mean, it's, Germany yeah. is probably still far away from 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 Sweden, but still, uh, the trend is very positive. Yeah, and I think you make a good point that it can happen greening the economy on many levels. Yeah, and it doesn't take place just on one, and one could be stronger and more proactive. 
but it could be on any of these levels that you're seeing green in the economy. And I think that's why we have all those levels in our course, because there, there are things we can do as an individual. There are things that can be done by businesses and private sector. Cities are taking a strong role in here in Scandinavia. We heard about that last week. And then the national policy, of course, is very strong in Scandinavia, but we see other levels also being key to it. Okay, I think we will we'll wrap up on yes. that note, and I will thank you both, Melko and Jonas, and we'll welcome Charlotte uh, to join us just for the last few minutes here to talk about the wrap up of the course. Yep, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Jen. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> now we've Hello. seen you at the national level in the film on procurement, but you've actually been involved with the MOOC in many other ways. Do you want to tell us a little bit? So yeah, I've had opportunity to be behind the scene and help develop this MOOC uh, in regards to both content and the mechanisms in, on the platform together with Coursera. It's been a very uh, interesting uh, learning Intense process. <laughs> and I'm very happy so far. Um, so yes, yeah, so let us then uh, just say a few words uh, as it comes to the uh, closing of the course. Mm -hmm. the, the end is uh, sadly not so far away or happily or however you want to see it. Uh, I would like to uh, remind you that originally we had a deadline for Sunday night, uh, midnight our time CET. Uh, but we have extended it to Monday night. So it's Monday, February 23rd. Okay. That is the hard That's deadline good. for everything. We've had uh, some participants ask for how long the course material yeah. is accessible, and that's a very good point. Uh, we have decided to keep it accessible for three weeks on the Coursera platform. Mm -hmm. And we will also, uh, very soon, uh, in, the few, in the next coming days, announce to you how we can keep in touch with all of you. Well, and good. we think that we can continue to discuss all these topics that have been highlighted both in the Hangouts and also in the forums. Yeah, because I've seen some forums that are talking about uh, there's already some informal LinkedIn groups set up and this sort exactly, of thing. Right, so yeah. we should. Uh, Stay tuned because we'll yeah. have more formal uh, yeah. ways to stay in touch. Here in Lund, we are very proud to keep in touch with the alumni mm -hmm. from many years back, and uh, we have the ambition to do so also with the MOOC participants. Yeah, and I think another thing that I've seen on the forums is a lot of uh, there's one forum thread about what people can do after the course to stay um, aware of environmental issues, and there's readings and videos and even more course-related content that's being generated by students. So you might take a look at that after the course ends to keep learning about these topics or learn more about particular topics. And I think that's something that we're also going to try to do with the course, um, that it will be developing. We hope to offer it again and have some, some different things in it. One of the final things we will do along this uh, line is to set up a, a, a special formal thread with suggestions for improvements. Okay. And there we also welcome all, all ideas or suggestions on further readings or other interesting examples and so on. Because what we want to do is, of course, to run this again and to kind of build on the learning experience, build on the information we have collected and all the opinions and, and knowledge from all of us, including you participants. Yeah, so we'll be learning on our end as well. But I see that there's there's one great forum that I brought up last week as well about uh, how participants in the course are going to be making changes in their own lives, in their own businesses, in their local communities, even in their, their national context. And it's great to see that, that taking action is definitely part of this. And what we learned today in this discussion is it's quite complex. Um, on all the levels, so we, we need to, to stay with it and keep keep working in the ways that we can, the ways that we've learned through this course, but also the ways continuing to learn what Absolutely. we can do. So we appreciate that. It's very rewarding for us to, to see that yeah. discussion taking place. All right. Inspiration. So we will we will close off this hangout <laughs> then, and we, we wish you all a good weekend and keep greening. Yes. Goodbye from Bye. Bye.